Blog Talk Radio. All right, everybody. Welcome to a special edition of Theology Matters with the Palouse. I'm your host, Devin Palou, and uh, we have been kind of out of commission for the last uh, few weeks with school and uh, some events with Ratio Christie and the apologetics conference that uh, came here to Charlotte and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in another show, kind of give you guys an uh, update. Uh, but tonight we have a special edition of Theology Matters. Those who have been listening uh, for some time now know that uh, uh, in October we like to do a show, uh, well, actually several shows, on the Protestant Reformation. And if you go to our Facebook page, that is uh, Theology Matters with the Palouse on Facebook there, uh, you can search the archives. Uh, we've done done several shows on the Reformation and uh, hosted a debate. It was probably, probably the most downloaded uh, debate we had. I think we had almost uh, 2,000 downloads within the week uh, with uh, Nathan Taylor and Devin Rose on uh, the issue of Sola Scriptura. People uh, really enjoyed it. They wanted another debate. So uh, I've got another discussion tonight for you guys. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, the doctrine of justification. And uh, we'll go ahead and just jump right into it because uh, we've got two hours. It sounds like a lot of time, but it's really not when you start jumping off, uh, kind of delving into these issues. So uh, first, let me go ahead and introduce my good friend, Doug Beaumont. He uh, will be representing the Catholic view of justification. He earned a MA in apologetics from Southern Evangelical Seminary, uh, where he served as assistant to Dr. Norman Geisler and taught Bible and religion for 10 years before converting to Catholicism. He's currently pursuing a PhD in theology at Northwest uh, University. It's not good when the, when the screen decides to go, go blank on you there. Let me see here if I can pull this up. But as, it's, as that is... Um, as that is pulling it up, let me tell you, I've, uh, Doug was a professor of mine for uh, a few years there at Southern Evangelical Seminary, and uh, his class was uh, absolutely one of my favorites in the world religions. We would go around to uh, we went to, a, to a Islamic mosque, we went to a Eastern Orthodox Church, and uh, it was it was a great time. Doug's Doug's a Doug's a great professor. Uh, let's see, so he's written the book, uh, Message Behind the Movie, and he contributed to the Apologetic Study Bible for students. Uh, he's contributed to the website, Got Questions, and he runs a blog called Soul Device, uh, where he writes on theology, philosophy, apologetics, and other topic, topics, and uh, he and his wife, Elaine, uh, reside in Charlotte metro area with their three children, and his wife, Elaine, is an uh, awesome lady as well. She can do everything from fix cars to <laughs> teach Hebrew and Greek. She's amazing. Uh, representing the Protestant side is going to be my friend uh, Tony Arsenal. And Tony's a recent graduate of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in South Hamilton, Massachusetts, where he received uh, Master's of Arts degrees in Church History and Theology, was awarded the Baker Award for Excellence in Theological Studies. He's presented papers uh, with the Evangelical Theological Society uh, and the Gordon Conwell Theology Forum. His current research interests are Trinitarian and Christological theology and Reformed systematics, early church and early church history. Tony lives near Hartford, Connecticut with his wife, Lee, and uh, they, he currently blogs at reformedarsenal.com and teaches systematic theology at his local church. So as you can see, we got some pretty high quality guys here tonight. So, Doug, Tony, are you there? I am here, sir. I am also here. All right. So glad to have you guys both uh, both on the line with us. Uh, let's just kind of jump into this thing. Uh, Tony, take uh, take two minutes, kind of explain what the Protestant view of justification uh, is, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get deeper into this, so you don't have to get real narrow, but it's kind of an overview. 
Sure. Thanks for having me on the show, and thanks uh, for joining me, Doug. Uh, the Protestant view of justification, um, although it would be a little inaccurate to say that there's just one Protestant view of justification, uh, tonight I'll be representing primarily kind of the classic uh, Reformed Protestant view, uh, but you wouldn't find too much of a disagreement from uh, sort of the classic Lutherans either. And that view is essentially that um, humans are justified entirely by God's grace and entirely through faith. Now, we would uh, acknowledge that God is free to show mercy on whoever he chooses in whatever way he chooses, um, but that the ordinary means by which we are united to Christ and gain his blessings and benefits uh, is through faith alone without any additional works or cooperation with grace. All right, and uh, Doug? Yeah, if I can just uh, begin with a little bit of a qualifier here. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to be representing the uh, Catholic version as, as best I can. Um, sola fide was not a huge issue for me in my conversion. Um, and having not come from a reform background, it, is, it especially was um, not a huge deal. And we can get more into that later. But um, I didn't spend as much time studying this this issue as I did others, so I'm 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 just going to say at, at the beginning that I, I hope I do well here <laughs> um, with uh, correctly representing the the Catholic view. So I think as far as justification goes, one of the biggest differences that people will notice is that for the Catholic, that word justification is actually looking at the process of salvation and and not just its initial starting point. And um, a lot of the disagreements between the two parties, I think, really boils down to that. Um, usually in the, in the Protestant schema, the, the process of salvation is broken up into several parts. Uh, popularly speaking, you've got justification, sanctification, glorification. Uh, these all refer to different um, parts of salvation, if you will, whereas the Catholic view is that justification is God's work throughout the whole thing. And if, if I... To put it simply, it would be that by God's grace, he is uh, making people just. Uh, that is, that's the word justification is coming from there, making them righteous. And that the salvation process includes the actual becoming of righteousness in the person and not simply its declaration. And so um, the Catholic is actually putting more into the idea of justification um, because they're looking at the entire process and calling it under that single heading rather than just the initial point, um, which would be brought about by faith. Okay, that's wonderful. So kind of the format for the show, folks, is uh, I've asked them to both kind of submit three questions, and then they'll ask a question, and then it'll be a 15- or 20-minute dialogue uh, and uh, just kind of have a back and forth as usual. You know, my, my goal is just to stay out of this uh, – discussion and, and let the two smart guys talk. And uh, with that being said, um, I should have looked at the questions first, but uh, Tony's first question to you, Doug, was can you please explain uh, the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification according to the Council of Trent? So is there anything you would add to kind of what you just said, or was that pretty much yeah? Well, no, it would probably be a good idea to, to answer that question in, in a, a bit more fullness, um, especially because okay. the concept is, is just so uh, pregnant with meaning uh, compared to what a lot of your listeners are, are probably picturing in their mind when they hear the word justification. And I think right. that clarifying our terms um, can be incredibly helpful. Um, okay. First of all, he, um, Tony asked about according to the Council of Trent. For those that don't know, the Council of Trent was the ecumenical council that was called to deal with issues um, primarily arising from the Reformation of the 16th century. And so within the council, lots of stuff was dealt with, but part of what was dealt with um, were things that were being brought up by some of the reformers. And so part of the Council of Trent is known as the Decree Concerning Justification. And this is where they go through uh, chapter after chapter uh, detailing certain aspects of what the church teaches about justification uh, over against what it was being challenged by with the reformers. And, and this is, it's a fairly beefy section. It, it would take me probably my entire time period just to read it, much less comment on it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just try to give some summary points. Um, one part 
that I think serves as a good summary and also maybe somewhat surprising to people that have not read it. Um, it goes like this. We are justified by faith, which is the beginning of human salvation, without which it is impossible to please God and come to the fellowship of his sons. This justification is gratuitous. None of the things that precede justification, whether faith or works, merit the grace of justification. And this, that paragraph is actually introduced by Trent as saying that this is the uninterrupted unanimity of the Catholic Church as it has held and expressed the doctrine of, of justification. So um, already you can probably see that there's, there's quite a bit more overlap than, than many would imagine. Um, again, I think that where the difficulty comes in is that justification is not a, a point in time in a person's life, but this, this word, when used in the Catholic sense, is actually referring to an entire process, which involves the forgiveness of sins, the recreation of the sinner, uh, the growth in grace, and, the, and the, the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, or love, depending on your translation. Um, God is causing this justification the whole time, um, but he is using things uh, to bring this justification about, such as the sacraments um, of uh, baptism, re uh, reconciliation, and these sorts of things, different means of getting grace to people. And what okay. comes out of it on the human side is going to be growth in justification, which, again, sounds really odd to someone who thinks of it as, as a single point, because how could you grow you know, in a point? Um, but rather, as, as a person's righteousness grows, as they actually become more just, the church calls that becoming justified. Uh, so this is not just a decree of God. It is a decree, but it's not just that. Uh, what God, you know, when God's word is spoken, things actually happen in reality. And so his declaration of justice in the person actually makes the person just. And this is something that happens through the entire life. It, it, it can increase. It can decrease. Um, it can be lost uh, through, through gross sin. I mean, if someone stops loving God and hates God, um, it can be lost. It can be regained by a regaining of faith and love. So there's a whole lot. I mean, almost the entire Christian life is really under this category of justification. And so we have to be very careful when we start talking about what is the Catholic view of this or that, that when we talk about justification, that... We're, are we talking about the entire process of the Christian life, or are we just talking about this initial moment? Okay, so kind of at this point, uh, we'll just let you guys uh, kind of have some, some uh, back-and-forth dialogue on this, Tony. I'll let you kind of ask him some questions and, uh, and uh, come back in about uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, and we'll move on to the next question. So, Tony, go ahead. What do you, what do you have for Doug? Sure. So I, I think in addition to what Doug uh, said, which I think is a fabulous um, summary of the, the Tridentine Doctrine, um, it's important for us to understand when we talk about causes that the uh, Council of Trent uh, dictates specific causes. Now, to kind of understand that, we have to understand a little bit about Aristotelian categories. So if you, if you go back to Aristotle, which much of the medieval Roman Catholic Church is dependent on philosophically uh, because of how much Thomas Aquinas was dependent on Aristotle, um, Aristotle had these different kinds of causes. So the analogy he used is that if you picture a sculptor who's making a, uh, a statue out of marble, You'll have the efficient cause, which would be the effort of the sculptor. You have the instrumental cause, which would be the you know the chisel and the hammer that the uh, efficient cause is kind of channeled through. The energy of the sculptor is kind of channeled through the instrumental cause. And then you have the final cause, which is kind of the end goal of the sculpture. So in his example, it was possibly it's to beautify a garden. So the fact that it's going to be in a garden and be beautiful is actually considered a cause of that statue. Um, there's also the formal cause, which is kind of the um, picture that the sculptor has in his mind of what this is going to be. So it's important for us to remember on the Catholic model that the instrumental cause of justification is the sacrament of baptism. Um, and that's related to faith, but it's the actual sacrament of baptism which brings about or initiates the uh, process of sanctification and justification, which, um, as Doug said, are all kind of collapsed into a single concept. Um, justification, sanctification, which we'll come to in some of the later questions, I think, are very uh, discrete concepts in Protestantism. 
but uh, in Catholicism, they're very connected. So that's really where this debate hinges, is it's not, um, you know, it would be a great disservice. R.C. Sproul, who's, you know, very opposed to Catholic doctrine, uh, has said that it's downright slanderous to say that the Roman Catholic Church teaches a salvation that's earned by the work of of, of a person, uh, because that's just not what they teach. But the distinction really is, what is the instrumental cause of uh, salvation, of justification? Because nobody disagrees that the final purpose of a Christian is to do good works for the glory of God. Nobody disagrees that the energy in salvation is purely a grace that's given to the Christian by God and that is unmerited. Um, but really where we do disagree is that instrumental cause. So where a Protestant comes in and they look at a passage like uh, Ephesians 2, where it says we're saved by grace through faith, that through, that dia, preposition of instrumentation. So they're looking at that and saying, well, we don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says we're saved through works or through baptism. Um, there's, you know, there's passages that refer and relate baptism to um, salvation, but that that clear instrumentality is not necessarily as explicit in some of the other passages. So it's important that we get that because that's really where our debate hinges. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a good point, and I'm, I'm glad you explained the causes for me, so I, I don't have to take up any time with that. <laughs> um, and that was a very good explanation. Um, one thing I would just point out to listeners, just because th- this is already getting, getting pretty deep, um, is that you, you brought up earlier that there, this idea of, of, normative, um, of normative doctrine, and, and I think that this is also the case here, that um, the sacrament of baptism being the instrumental cause is a normative means of God's grace. Uh, there's lots of normative means. Um, but I think that what confuses some people is that when you say X is the means of something, they think that, well, then without the X, you can't possibly have this thing that it is the cause of. And in Catholic theology, that's not the case with baptism, because first, um, it is actually the faith of the parents uh, that is that is uh, being uh, – that is, is the reason that the that the child, for example, is being baptized – and so an adult would not be baptized without faith, and a baby would not be baptized without the faith of the parent. So faith is still uh, preceding the baptism. And also, it's not the case that someone who is unbaptized is necessarily um, not going to receive justification. Um, there's, there, are, there are qualifying events, um, desire for baptism, but suppose you, you know, like the thief on the cross, he might have desired baptism, but obviously there was no way he was going to get it. Um, or someone that desired baptism but couldn't find anyone to do it and then died on the way, Um, or even the heathen. Uh, The the Catholic Church holds out hope that that God may even elect to save certain people, um, even apart from faith per se, in the sense that uh, they are in a situation where the knowledge of the gospel and even the ability to have faith in it are just not present. And the church doesn't weigh in one way or the other about whether someone in that situation is saved, but they do hold out hope that it could be. And, and all of that is just to say that you know, pretty much any time we're discussing these kinds of doctrines where there's any kind of human interaction, uh, there is um, quarter left um, for unusual circumstances. Um, the church doesn't think that God is, is just waiting to send someone to hell if, if they don't tick off every you know, <laughs> checkbox uh, that they're supposed to. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that as far as instrumental cause is concerned, that you know, whereas a sculptor could not sculpt marble without the chisel, without the instrumental cause, um, that is not the case with, with the sacraments. Well, now okay. that hasn't so been the uniform position throughout the history of the church, though, has it? I mean, that that's something that, Obviously, it took time to develop, but that was really brought into dogma at, at uh, Vatican II, right? Yeah, I, there's, I mean, there was discussion of it, and, and different people have held to different um, theories. I mean, the whole idea of limbo um, for unbaptized babies um, is, is present throughout church history. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone ever went so far as, as like a strong Calvinist to say that, that you know, God just predestined some you know, babies to hell or something like that. Um, but yeah, when it was defined in council as dogma, this is where it came out. 
So that's okay. Because the, there have yeah. been, I mean, I'll I'll bring in some quotes later from a bishop in Rusby named Fulgentius, but one of the um, things that Fulgentius argued, um, I think to his detriment, is that a baby on its way to be baptized that gets killed in the road would be condemned, you know, condemned to hell because justification as the instrument or baptism as the instrument of justification can only come through the sacrament of baptism and only through the church, right? We go back to kind of that old novation maxim that there's no salvation apart from the church. And what we see is over time, um, I I think to her, her glory, the Catholic church has sort of reshaped some of those, um, some of those ideas even between uh, Novation and then you get Augustine in the Donatist controversy who relaxes that Novation dictum. Um, I just feel like uh, that that's part of the reason why I wanted to zero in on the Trent discussion because a lot of times when we look at Trent, if you just take Trent and you hold it up against Vatican II, it, it takes a little bit of, uh, I shouldn't say a little bit, it takes quite a bit of explaining to see how we can get from what we have in Trent, which is a very dogmatic exclusion of anyone who doesn't come in through the ordinary instrumental means of, of justification um, through, not just through baptism, but through the, the, the church's baptism, the Roman Catholic church's baptism, um, you know, which kind of, I think kind of anticipates the next question um, on my docket, but that hard stance that takes at, that's taken at Trent really does kind of get softened when we get to Vatican II. And I know that there's um, explanations and processes and clarifications, but when we're talking about the, you know, we're, we're in Reformation month, so it would be a be kind of remiss not to talk about Trent and kind of what the, the actual dispute in the Reformation was and how that's kind of gotten us to where we are now. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, what, one of the difficulties I think that, um, and, and I'm not accusing you of this, but but in general that Protestants, including myself, have with trying to understand Catholic doctrine is, is thinking that the means by which you understand a doctrine is to look back through history and see what a bunch of important people have said. Um, ultimately, Catholic dogma is, is that which is determined um, in a special way. And whatever conversation was happening up until that point um, is, is not really material to the, to the, the final form it takes. Um, you know, if, if Fulgentius said that, then he was wrong. You know, Aquinas was wrong on some things. Augustine was wrong on some things. Um, so I, I'm trying to deal not so much with what uh, Trent said back then and what people might have understood by it back then. I do think that that's important historically, but once the church has spoken and answered a certain question that has maybe arisen because of a conversation that has happened, then, then that really is the church dogma and that's really the only thing that counts as far as what the Catholic view is. So I, I understand that I'm, I'm looking back 500 years at something that was happening in a, in a particular context in a different time, and I'm sort of interpreting it through what the church has said in the last 500 years. Um, but that is the, the legitimate process for a Catholic. So, but I mean, Trent, Trent was a dogmatic, infallible declaration according to the Roman Catholic Church, right? That's right. Okay. But it needs to be and I mean, even, even even sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, so yeah, the 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 dogmatic um, utterances, if you will, of of any ecumenical council uh, stand forever. Um, what those mean, um, how they're applied in different contexts, those kinds of things continue to develop, and that's why there there continues to be a need uh, for an infallible uh, magisterium. Um, and for continued councils. Uh, so, for example, you know, you've got things said in, in very early councils that I think we would all agree with that end up getting brought up again and again in later councils and, and honed. Um, and the fact that they weren't honed prior to any particular council doesn't mean that anything goes. Um, once something is laid out, that is the understanding, even if it's the understanding of a previous infallible declaration. So. If you know, it, Trent could have been misunderstood by someone, and that that misunderstanding could have held for hundreds of years. But until the church says we dogmatically proclaim that this is the way to understand it, um, it, it remains up in the air. And, and once they do dogmatically define how to understand it, then that becomes the 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 right way. Sure, but I mean, even as even as recent as Vatican I, um, there was still you know, language being used 
out of Vatican I by papal pronouncements and other things like that, that would use the same language as Vatican II in regards to even something as um, kind of uncontroversial as the fact that Scripture is infallible and in, inerrant, um, or in you know more germane to our discussion that Protestants are kind of beyond salvation. It wasn't until Vatican II that we see evidence that the Roman Catholic Church is now starting to say, well, no, Protestants are separated brethren, they're Christians, they're just not fully Christians, they're probably not damned because Christ has saved them, but they don't have full communion. Um, it just seems, uh, just to be really honest, without trying to be adversarial, it just seems sort of disingenuous to say, well, the the council could have proclaimed X doctrine, and at the time they meant this, um, but then, you know, in Vatican I, they kind of said, yeah, we say the same things as Vatican, as Trent does, but then Vatican II, it's kind of an adjustment to say, well, no, what, what Trent and Vatican I really meant, um, it just seems like that's a very postmodern kind of way to approach it, to say, well, the words didn't have meaning inherent in themselves, it's, they only get meaning through our interpretation of it, um, kind of a neo-Orthodox Bardian kind of spin on it, um, which shouldn't be all that surprising with the influence of Karl Rahner uh, on Vatican II, but that that just doesn't, you have to, I'm, I think you probably understand from a, especially a reform position, um, that just feels like, well, the Roman Catholic Church is able to just go back and kind of selectively interpret things. You know, we're in the midst of this big discussion on the Synod of the Family and what's going to come out of it. And is, you know, is, Roman, is Rome going to change their view on marriage? Um, well, of course, Rome's not going to say they're going to change their view on marriage. But when it comes out that something is being treated radically different than it was 100 years ago, you kind of have to understand why the rest of us step back and go, oh, that seems a little, a little strange. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, from, from a human standpoint, uh, doctrinal development often looks like that. Um, you know, you, you hear the same kinds of arguments from Jehovah's Witnesses with regard to the Trinity. You know, you can go back to this point, and this guy said this thing, and that's not necessarily that. And um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there is, you know, I mean, it's, it's no big secret that Catholics essentially trust the Church, <laughs> you know, to be infallible under certain conditions, and, and, and that, you know, you submit at those points. Um, I mean, the canon of Scripture went through quite a bit of, of uh, development. There, there were canons produced by the church that don't match our canon today. Um, and, and that can be, and, you know, this, this is where you get your Bart Ehrmans and people like that, but, you know, they're, they're just doing objective historical research, and, and the reason they're reaching um, poor conclusions is essentially just because they don't trust the process. Um, they're not necessarily wrong about how the canon got put together. It's a very messy sometimes ugly process if you look at it historically, and there's no reason to trust it um, other than that you believe that God guided the church through it and, and he just decided to use those messy processes uh, to develop the canon. So I, I understand definitely what it, what it can look like, especially when you, you, know, you have disagreements with the dogmas um, or if it seems like you're the target of <laughs> some of the dogmas um, – to then go, well, wait a minute, how come 500 years ago I was anathema and now I'm a Christian brother? Um, and it, it, I don't think it's just a redefinition. Um, it's, it's not just the idea that, well, we can just redefine these words in a postmodern sense to, to make a, a whole new sentence out of them. Um, the, the context at the time of Trent is very different than now. Uh, we're dealing with the sons of 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 the reformers. We're not dealing with Catholic priests who should know better. Um, and that was part of the reason for some of the, the, the changes as well, is that, well, what, what a Protestant was in the time of Luther is not necessarily what a Protestant is right now. Um, they are in a completely different context, and so we, now we have to explain how the anathemas of Trent apply to them, if they even do, and as it turns out, they don't. Okay, Tony, go ahead and uh, just take a minute or two to respond to that. And then we need to move on to the uh, next question that you have posted, Doug. Take a, take a minute and uh, respond to that, and then we need to move on to uh, Doug's question. Sure. I, I guess, I mean, I can understand the, the statement. Um, it, it just seems to me that the language of the context of Vatican I um, and Vatican II are not that different in terms of what a Protestant is compared to Trent, obviously. Um, we're not talking about 500 years ago. We're talking about 
you know, 150 years ago at the most. Um, and, you know, you have language in Vatican I of Protestants being schismatics and heretics um, who were not former Catholic priests who uh, should know better. They're, they're the children of the children of the children of Protestants, um, and they're still, you know, schismatics and heretics. And then we get to Vatican II, and all of a sudden we're separated brethren. We have anonymous Christians out there who are following Jesus and don't quite know it. Um, it it just seems like to anyone who's not already presupposing that the church is going to get it right and that the church has it right, um, it sure looks like a change of mind is all that I'm I'm kind of getting at. All right, and uh, Doug's first question to you, in, and uh, we, I've heard this a lot, so this will be uh, this will be glad glad uh, he asked this question. <laughs> He said, Martin Luther is accused of both adding to and subtracting from Scripture, uh, adding alone to Romans 3.28, for example, and dismissing James' epistle uh, to support his view of justification. Uh, what is your response to these actions? Sure, yeah, and, and I hear this all the time, and um, to be honest, it's it's kind of a sort of one of those questions that you get a little bit sick of answering. Um, it's an important question, but it's kind of the, the go-to to, to try to defame uh, Luther. And on one level, it doesn't really matter what Martin Luther did. Um, Martin Luther was a fallible, frail person. He said a lot of things that I, as a Reformed Christian, I think are kind of wacky. Um, he said a lot of things that I think anybody who's in their right mind would think is a little wacky. Um, but as far as I know, Luther never actually added the word alone to the Bible. What he did was he was uh, providing an interpretation, writing down his interpretation. So it's not all that different than when we look at something like Eugene Peterson's version, The Message, um, which I, I don't like, but he doesn't make any pretenses that he's, he's actually changing the Bible. He's just providing his interpretation. So Luther would have viewed the word alone in Romans 3.28 as uh, fundamental to the concept that Paul was communicating. So when he was providing his translation, like you do sometimes when you're translating from one language to another, you have to communicate uh, a concept that may have been in the original in one word. You sometimes have to add words to try to flesh out that concept. Um, so I, I don't see what Luther did with Romans as um, adding to the Bible. As far as I know, he never tried to make an argument that that was in the original text or should have been in the original text. Um, he was simply kind of interpreting the Bible and including a word to help his readers understand that interpretation. Um, as far as James goes, I think it's important, and Doug kind of mentioned it earlier, the canon wasn't a static, uh, stable, dogmatically defined uh, entity until until the Council of Trent. So the fact that James uh, was in question by not just um, not just people on Protestant side that were questioning whether James was canonical. There were people on the Catholic side, including Cardinal uh, Cajetan, who was the, the primary prosecutor of Luther, who were asking these kinds of questions regarding various canonical books. Um, Second Peter is kind of classically one of the ones that's always been in question. Um, and so what Luther was doing was what everyone was doing. He was looking at the text. He was drawing conclusions about the um, doctrine that James is presenting, and he was comparing that doctrine to the rest of the books that were accepted. Um, kind of like how in the um, the Marcionite uh, heresy in the early church, they would look at the documents that were being presented, and they would compare it to the regular fide. And they would say, well, this Gnostic gospel doesn't match with the regular fide, so we know that it's not inspired because the regular fide has been handed down to us. So it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, another important point is that um, James was very central to Luther's theology later in life. So where we see Luther kind of questioning James and calling it a pistol of straw, which is kind of the classic uh, phrase that gets pulled out, he, he was really early in his process of kind of trying to understand what was going on. But after he had studied and, and come to his conclusions, he actually, James became a very important part of his uh, theological process. That's where we get the the Lutheran distinction between uh, the active obedience of Christ and the passive obedience of the believer, which is different than the Reformed uh, use of those terms. In Lutheranism, the active obedience of Christ is the, uh, the righteousness that Christ gives us. Our passive righteousness is the righteousness we have before our neighbors as we do good works. So for Luther, 
uh, James became kind of the foundation of that um, in his understanding of how those two kinds of righteousness interplay with each other and how the active uh, righteousness of Christ given to us produces the passive righteousness that we display before our neighbors. Okay, Doug, okay. Uh, go ahead and oh, respond. Go ahead. Yep. Oh, no, I just said, then go ahead and respond or ask questions or whatever you like. Yeah, I I appreciate that you're probably uh, tired of hearing that question because I I'm sure it's just you know it it, it can kind of just look like a backhanded you know oh yeah well what about this embarrassing fact from history uh, <laughs> but not knowing sure. your background um, when I wrote the questions I, I wasn't really sure um, which of the different sola fides you you would choose um, to discuss here and so that that's why I threw that in there was kind of a way to find out. Um, you said that Martin Luther, what he did doesn't really matter. And, and I think that the reason he does matter in, in at least some sense is that he is, I, I would argue, is the inventor of sola fide. And so there's a sense in which um, if you're not going to hold to what he meant by it, then, well, we can talk about that as well. But my my concern about what he did with, with his translation and, uh, and, and his problem with James is not so much just that whether or not it was legitimate to question the canon or whether it's ever legitimate to add a word to a translation, but rather why he did it. Um, I would argue that mo- most of the ways that I have heard the doctrine of sola fide laid out, it is basically in a direct contradiction to James 2.24. Um, if, you, if you take the word not out of James 2.24, which is the only verse in Scripture where the words justification faith, and alone appear in Scripture, then you have the doctrine of sola fide. You put the not back in there, you have the Bible. That, that is a direct logical contradiction. And it's one that Luther himself recognized. Uh, he said that James is, is flatly against Paul and all the rest of Scripture. Um, he says that in Romans 4, St. Paul teaches to the contrary. Um, he, he accuses James of mangling the Scriptures. Um, he said, many have tried to make James agree with Paul, but not successfully. These do not harmonize. Faith justifies. Faith does not justify. To him who can make these two agree, I will give my doctor's cap, and I'm willing to be called a fool. So I'm not not suggesting that that merely adding one's thoughts into a translation is wrong, because like you said, everybody does that to some extent. Um, And I'm not saying that at the time it was totally illegitimate to question what was in the canon, because like you said, it was an open question at that time. But rather, it's the fact that that Martin Luther very specifically did these things in order to push his idea of sola fide against what he knew the scripture said. And he was quite aware, his interlocutors pointed these things out, and I'm sure you know his responses that basically say Martin Luther will have it that way, so, you know, tell the papist donkeys to, you know, go fart or whatever it was he said. Um, so it's, I, I agree that his process wasn't necessarily wrong, but I think that the reasons behind it are very revealing. That The inventor of sola fide, which is the subject of, of this discussion, uh, could not square it with what he saw in, in the Bible. And I, I, I still see that as a, as a difficulty. Sure. Do you happen to have a quote for that, uh, that quote from Luther about giving his doctor's hat? Do you have a citation for that? Yeah, that was Table Talks. Um, Translated, let's see, um, Table Talks. I, I'm just telling you what, what the whole entire thing is here that I wrote down. I, sure. I, don't, I, I don't have the uh, the book. Um, I have Table Talks, VMR, uh, Volume 3, page 3292. Sure. Yeah, and, and one of the issues that we run into with Luther, um, I love Luther. Um, he's like the crazy uncle that you like to sit with at Christmas dinner just to see what he's going to do. Um, <laughs> The table talks uh, had a lot of beer involved. They had a lot of uh, joking around, and they often went late into the night. So we have to kind of, when we talk about Luther and we talk about his quotes out of table talk, we have to kind of recognize that he wasn't necessarily at his best. Um, and he was prone to kind of these statements of where he kind of flew off into these fanciful things. You know, he's, he's well known for saying that Jesus was an adulterer, Jesus was a thief. Um, when you cross-reference that with his actual theological works rather than just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze at a table with his students. Um, what we see is a, a further explanation of that. Um, now that's not to say that Luther was right in his um, motivations for, for questioning James. But I, I think that um, when we look at even the way the early church decided, as far as we can tell, what was scripture and what wasn't, 
um, the process that Luther is going by is not all that different. And one of the major, um, the major questions that was asked in the early church when kind of deciding the canonical status was, how does this square up with the theology of other, um, of other documents? And so if Luther is genuinely looking at James and saying, um, well, this, this just doesn't square up, I think he interpreted it wrong at that point in his life. I think his interpretation later on uh, is much more apt to what the text is actually getting at, and we will we'll probably talk about that in a few minutes here. But um, to look at the text and say, well, I just can't figure out how this squares up with the clear teachings that I'm seeing in a larger portion of the text, to then question the canonical status of that is not really something that I think is, is really a problem at all. Um, even R.C. Sproul in... Um, are we together, which is kind of his, his most recent entry into the debate, he'll say that uh, we hold that the church was called to make decisions in history as to whether certain books belong in the canon. And he says, it's conceivable that the church could have made a mistake in what it included or excluded. And that's in the context of a discussion where he's saying that historically, Protestantism has always affirmed that the decision as to whether this book or that book is inspired and therefore part of the canon is a fallible decision. So that doesn't mean that he thinks anyone has failed. Um, we have good reason to think that the, the books that we have are um, you know, reliable, accurate books that should be in the canon. But we can't, as if we're consistent Protestants, we can't say that there's an infallibility anywhere in the church in determining which books are the Bible or not. So I don't think there's anything Luther was doing that was inherently anti-Protestant or un-Protestant, um, or even really a, a serious question in terms of sola scriptura, because um, it wasn't the question as to whether James was uh, was was authoritative as scripture. It was the question as to whether it was scripture or not. If it was scripture which Luther concluded it was, then he is bound by it, and that's where his theology developed later. If it's not scripture, then of course it is an epistle to straw. It could be mangled scripture. Um, he very well could have gotten, you know, James could have gotten his argument wrong and could be contradicting Paul. Um, now, I don't think he was, and uh, Luther later in his life didn't think that he was. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's a valuable question to ask, and I appreciate that you've, you know, you've really got more of a theological underpinning below it than just kind of a classic, ah, gotcha kind of a thing. Um, but like I said, and, and I think, too, we'll, we'll come to this in, in one of your later questions. The idea that Luther invented sola fide is, is just not really a sustainable point. Um, there's all sorts of antecedents in church history you know, driving at that. Um, there is some unique aspects to Luther's proposal, um, but to say that the whole, as a whole it's unique um, really doesn't bear scrutiny, I don't think. But we'll, I'll put that on hold until we get to that question of yours. Doug, did you want to go ahead and respond? We've still got you know, five minutes or so before we go on to the next question. Did you guys want to keep oh, interacting, okay. or, or did you want to go to the next question, or what do you guys want to do? I, I don't think I'll take the whole five minutes. Um, I'll, I'll just maybe add a little bit, and we'll we'll probably move on because I think some of the other questions are going to be more meaty, okay. and we could probably use that time. <laughs> um, That's fine. But just one one thing you brought out that that I wasn't even um, going to bring up, but I, I just thought I'd mention since it's out there, um, is that this whole idea of the fallible canon, um, and you know the 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 questioning of it as being a perfectly Protestant thing to do, I, I would agree, um, which is part of the reason I'm Catholic now. Um, the uh, the very canon of the New Testament, um, as you said, two things. Number one was basically chosen based on the church's um, teachings, which preceded it, um, and was determined uh, even, you know, that the, uh, Protestants have the same New Testament canon at Trent. So I, I just, I found those to be interesting. As an evangelical, I, I wasn't taught a lot of those things. Um, and uh, so, you know, not being Lutheran, I'm, I'm not going to hold, I'm not going to hold um, a whole lot more of the discussion up with, with discussions of Luther, um, but um, I, like I said, I, I just think it's important to note that at Sola Fides, at least in Lutheran's, uh, Luther's terms, Genesis, that th this is the kind of thing it took. Um, ignoring alone, which is part of the, de the very definition of Sola Fide, in, in one passage and then adding it in another. Um, I, ju I just think that's revealing. Sure. And, and um, if it's all right with you, Devin, I, I think I'll probably forfeit my second question um, and if it's okay with Doug, to kind of go through James, because I think that's really, you know, 
Christian, uh, Catholics and Protestants both want to tie their theology to the Scripture. Um, that's another one of those slanderous things that Protestants who don't know any better say is that Catholics don't care what the Scriptures say. Um, so if it's okay with you, I would like to maybe spend a little more time really going through and, and explaining uh, the Protestant view on James and how it coheres with the rest of the canon. It's I, may not have a, I may not have a whole lot to say in response. Um, I'm actually sitting in my car in a parking lot right now because my uh, <laughs> the space that I thought I was going to get to use, uh, I did not actually get access to. So I, I'm not sure how much I can join into that conversation, but that would be fine. Sure. So I think um, one of the difficulties with um, with the critique that happens of James 2 is we read the word dikaio, which is the, the Greek word for... Um, for justify, the, the verbal form of the Greek word for justify. We read it uh, in James to be the same meaning as we see it in, uh, in Paul. Um, and when we look at the actual usage of the word throughout the New Testament, um, and even in extra, testament, extra biblical usage, um, it really has a pretty broad um, base. So, I mean, we do have the classic you know, justification is a legal declaration. Um, that's not really something that's contested by anybody, even a lot of Catholic scholars. Joseph Fitzmyer is kind of one of the most recent, have acknowledged that Dikaio, uh, in its original usage, had to do with the legal proclamation that a judge would make. Um, so it was a declarative verb. We can get into differences in, you know, prenominal suffixes and all sorts of linguistic reasons to vindicate that, but I don't think that that's really germane. Um, but what we see with justify is uh, we look at uh, passages like um, Matthew 11, uh, where Jesus says, wisdom is justified by her deeds. Um, and what we see is a usage where justify takes on a meaning that's much closer to vindicate or prove or establish. So in the passage, um, the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus because of his activity of eating and drinking with sinners. Um, and he says, well, wisdom is justified by her deeds, or in some, some uh, manuscripts it says children. And um, what we see is that justify, just like it, it does in English, justify can take on that sort of vindication. So I can say that um, my results in a sales context justify my methods. Now, that doesn't mean that my methods were legally unsound, and now that they've produced results, they are now legally sound. What it means is that my methods are proven to be valid by the fact that they produce results. So the question we have to ask with James is not so much um, how do we you know, reconcile that Luther removed that not. What we have to reconcile and how we have to understand is what, how is justify being used. And so I think the key to that is really looking at James 21, uh, 2.21, where it references Abraham. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now, when we look back to that passage, um, that actually happens well after uh, Abraham exercises faith. You know, he exercises faith by leaving uh, Ur of the Chaldeans. And um, Paul initiates that as the moment when he was justified in the sense that Paul uses the term justified. But James is pointing at the incident with Isaac on Mount Moriah, and when we look at that incident, it's not a legal proclamation. It's God vindicating Abraham's faith. And that's where we get God saying, well, now I know, as in now you've demonstrated, now you've vindicated or validated that you fear me. So James is pointing back at that and saying, you want to have vindication of salvation, you want to have vindication um, that there's faith, then works must proceed. Um, and we, you know, we see that. He says it explicitly. This is why I, I'm not entirely sure where the debate even came in or how Luther you know, didn't really get it. I know this is where he comes in later. But the question is, how do you show that you have faith? And how, what James says is, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So what James is really doing is he's getting at this vindication kind of pattern. Um, and beyond that, the, you know, the next kind of classic point that people make is a statement uh, where it says, you see that faith, this is verse 22, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. Now that word completed, uh, that's the word that we see as teleo, uh, or teleo actually, and that word it has to do with bringing something from a, a state of being questionable to a state of being beyond question, that you've now brought it to its intended goal or its intended end, and now it has reached that end. 
not to say that it was imperfect or ineffective before, but now that it's reached its end, it's no longer objectionable. And this is, uh, this is the definition which comes out of the BDAG, which is kind of the standard uh, New Testament Greek and extra testamental Greek uh, lexicon. It says one of the options is to overcome or supplant an imperfect state of things by one that is free from objection. So the point here is not that it's a perfection of faith itself, but that it's a, uh, a bringing of a state where that faith is no longer questionable, um, which falls right in line with Paul's sequence in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, or 8 through 10, where he says, you're saved by grace, through faith, for works. So just like in the Council of Trent's declaration on uh, justification, we have the final cause, I'm quoting here from chapter uh, 7 of the Declaration of Trent, the final cause is the glory of God and Christ and life everlasting. Um, so let your good works shine before men so that they may glorify your Father in heaven. So in, in the Reform perspective and in the kind of confessional classic Lutheran perspective, we're saved by grace through faith unto salvation of good works. Um, and that's exactly what James is getting at. It's that Abraham had faith that was not proven. He then was given a task, and then by accomplishing that faith, his faith or his that task, his faith was brought to its intended end, and once it reached that intended end, it was no longer questionable. So this is a vindication before God in the in the account of Abraham. God Himself says, "Now that you've done this, I see that you fear me." Um, it's a vindication for us. Now we look back at Abraham and go, "Wow, he really he really did have the kind of faith that saves. He had the faith that would even sacrifice his own son." Um, so I think really understanding that that James context is important because I, I don't think there's any um, I don't think there's really any contradiction with what Paul is teaching and neither did Clement of Rome in his first letter to the Corinthians um, in chapters 30 and following he uses that same argument he uses the term the same way he says Abraham attained righteousness and through through faith they were glorified and magnified. Uh, not through themselves or their own righteousness, but through God's will. And then it says we may um, be justified. Uh, Almighty God has justified all who have existed from the beginning uh, in this way. And it's um, Clement is moving in that same progression of showing how faith produces good works, and then those good works validate and justify the faith as true, genuine, salvific faith. Um, the classic Lutheran line is faith Faith alone saves, but never faith that is alone. And the point is not to say there's a kind of faith that's alone. The point is to say that faith that is alone is as illogical and inconsistent as uh, a square circle or a married bachelor. It's just an, an entity that can't exist and therefore can't save okay. you. Okay, Doug, uh, let you jump in here a bit. And uh, any any questions or thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I I think... Uh, the difficulty that I have right here is I, I just I just don't have the tools I would need to go into a, a big Greek exegesis here. Um, but I'm also not um, a huge fan of doing theology by lexicon, so to speak. Um, there's always more difficulties. Uh, Paul uses different salvation terms in uh, unusual ways, in innovative ways. Um, you know, obviously. Uh, the Bible was written in Koine Greek, or the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, which is just kind of the street language of the day. Um, a lot of innovation of the language had to take place for the New Testament writers to use that language to co communicate these brand new truths. Um, and I think that the salvific terms are just not that simple. Um, you have him in uh, using uh, Dikayu to describe what seems to be sanctification in Romans 6, um, you have him just talking about glorification as if it's in the past in Romans 8.30. Um, so, you know, there, there's, some, there's some difficulties there with, with flattening the, the terms out. Um, also, as far as James' usage, I mean, just at first glance, um, part of the difficulty I think that, that exists here is that James is using the same Greek word in James 2 that Paul uses in Romans 4. It's, they're both talking about salvation. And they're both using the exact same illustration to understand what they're saying about the very same word. And so if we're going to um, pull this definition in James to get him um, out of contradiction with Paul, then, then it seems like we just could be right back in, in the same uh, issue again. Now, if the word has that much leeway, well, then, then the Catholic is, is free to use it as well. And so the difficulty is when we talk about James and his justification, um, 
you know, James 2.21 uses Genesis 22, his faith when he offered up Isaac. And yet two verses later, it talks about um, Abraham's faith in Genesis 15 um, when he believed God's promise uh, that he would that he would be the father of many nations, and this is the same thing that Paul refers to in Romans four. They use the same illustration, and Paul also mentions it in Galatians three. So you've got some pretty heavyweight sola fide passages that seem to be using the same word, same context, with the same illustration. Um, so I'm, I'm just not sure it's legitimate to switch the meaning. As well, well Hebrews but... eleven eight. Let me let me just go through my whole thing, and then we can oh, we can see what. Um, Hebrews 11.8 refers to Abraham's faith in Genesis 12. So for the Catholic, the way to understand this is not to change the definition of justification or, or even to pick from um, potentially legitimate different definitions, but rather to say this is exactly what we're talking about. The justification is a process that increases uh, with works. And so every single one of those mentions of Abraham's faith is an instance of his justification. And so as we progress in history from Genesis 12 to 15 to 22, and you have James and Paul, and, and I think Paul, but whoever the writer of Hebrews was, referring back to these different instances and referring to them as, as legitimate belief, legitimate faith, justification, the, the Catholic paradigm has no trouble understanding those passages at all. So I, you know, maybe, maybe there's a tie there, um, and, and no one's going to win that one. But um, the, the language that is adopted with sola fide is exactly the words used by James. And, um, you know, I understand that it can, excuse me, I understand that theologically the contradiction can be avoided. I mean, you know, vir virtually any contradiction can be avoided uh, theologically. So I'm not saying it's, it's an illegitimate process. I'm just saying on the surface of it, you know, I, I kind of have to agree with Luther that if, if, if his doctrine of sola fide is correct, then I don't think that James can be reconciled. So, you know, I, I understand it's fine that theologically there's a way out of the contradiction, but the Catholic doesn't have one to deal with at all, at, at least in these cases. Th th this view of justification fits just perfectly with uh, Catholic theology. And just one last thing, you, you mentioned the, uh, the faith alone and not the faith that is alone. I think another thing, aside from the fact that justification is seen as a, as a point by Protestants and a, and a process by Catholics, is what does faith mean? Okay, we've, we've kind of talked about what alone means. Now we've got to talk about fide, right, what faith means. And the, the Catholic, um, in, in trying to keep faith, hope, and love, which are distinguished in uh, 1 Corinthians, in order to keep those distinct, the Catholic doesn't roll those other things into the notion of faith. And so that is where they get the idea of, of a dead faith or a useless faith versus a living one, saving one, is that you can have faith without hope. You can have faith without love. You can have faith without works. Um, but it is a combination of those things that bring salvation. And so that's the notion of sola fide that they're arguing against. What, what, what they're saying is it is not the case that a faith that is merely you know, like an intellectual assent saves. And, and I think that we would probably both agree with that um, because you, you sound more on the Reformed side um, than maybe, you know, the, the free grace, dispensational DTS, some of these other guys do. Um, again, I didn't know which version of sola fide I'd be discussing today because there are so many of them. But it, it points out the, the fact that it's very important to get all these words straight up front because, um, you know, it may sound like I'm trying to be evasive or <laughs> pedantic, um, but Protestantism is the cause of, of this confusion. There are so many different versions of sola fide. What does it mean to be alone? Uh, what does it mean to have faith? What has to be rolled up into faith? Um, until we get down to exactly what the Catholic view is versus exactly whichever sola fide you choose, um, there's going to be that difficulty. So I, I, would, I would agree in a sense that, yeah, faith is never alone if it saves. If it's a saving faith, then, if, then it's not alone. But then you're not saying that it's faith alone anymore. And that's the Catholic understanding of why sola fide is false. If, if you, if you well, tweak faith enough to define it as everything you need to have saving faith, well, then the Catholic can agree with sola fide. Go ahead. Well, and I think I think you're kind of wanting to have your cake and eat it too, with all due respect, because on one level you 
kind of claim that I shouldn't be flattening out the term justify, but then you kind of in the next breath also say, well, we have to, why would we change the definition? And it's not as though I'm just picking a definition out of a lexicon. Um, I'm not doing theology by the lexicon. Um, if you read James 2, that's just the process that it takes. James is asked, what good is faith, my brothers, if, if it does not accompany works? And then he says, well, you want to see faith, then I'll show you my faith by my works. So even just within the context of James 2, the the faith is a, or the works are a demonstration of faith. They're not a cause of salvation. Um, and I mean, I'm I'm not like I said, I'm not picking a, a definition out of a dictionary. We've got Jesus using it this way. We've got the example that Paul or that um, James picks here is a demonstration of faith, not a generation of righteousness. Um, and we have the fact that faith is completed by works in the sense that faith is brought to its end, its goal, its telos by works, um, which is something that the, uh, you know, uh, you and I can agree on. I can agree with the doctrine of uh, Trent that the final cause or the final, um, yeah, the final cause of faith is, or of salvation is works. We are saved for works, not by works. And that's, I mean, that's, like I said, that's the key of the distinction. Um, I just, I just don't think that you've really resolved the issue by just saying, well, this is the way that it. This is the way that it's always been understood. Because that's, I mean, we we don't have time obviously to dig into it. And it doesn't sound like you have uh, the resources in front of you to really be able to to substantiate that. And that's fine. But to say, well, this is just the understanding that's always been in play, um, really is kind of a cop out argument. Because um, there are all sorts of people throughout church history that are talking about how we are saved by faith and not by works. Um, yeah, I, I didn't. You know, I didn't actually say that this is the way it's always been understood. I, I understand that there's been quite a bit of discussion. Right. So I, I just think that we have to, you know, we when we're talking about James two, we have to grapple with James's argument on its own terms. Um, I agree with you that we shouldn't read Paul's meaning of justify into um, James's letter. Um, but in my understanding, that's exactly what the Catholic position is trying to do. They're trying to say that James is, is necessarily using the word justify the same way that Paul is using the word justify. And we have we have no good reason to think that that's the case. And we have linguistic evidence from within the, the New Testament itself that Jesus used justify the other way, um, or one of the other ways in at least one instance. Jesus didn't use the word dikaio. He didn't use that verb very often, at least in the you know recording we have in the New Testament. So when he uses it, he uses it in this sense, to justify, to validate, to vindicate wisdom by her deeds. Um, so it that? seems reasonable to me that if James's, you know, Jesus's, um, uh, if, if James, who's a close associate of Jesus by family in some way, um, if he is growing up with the same linguistic context, literally the same linguistic context as Jesus, to say that they're using it the same way over and against Paul, who's using it, who comes up in a totally different context, who had a you know potentially had a classical education, was a citizen of Rome, um, uh, it just doesn't make sense to me to try to say that Paul and James have to be using the term the same way when we have good evidence to see they're not. Well, now what what passage is this that you're referring to where Jesus uses it in that way? Uh, Matthew eleven nineteen and the parallel in Luke. I don't have what the parallel. Uh, it's Luke seven thirty five, and he says wisdom is dikaio justified by her deeds. Now he's not saying wisdom is made uh, is made righteous or wisdom is transformed um, by God's grace uh, into something else um, that it wasn't. He's saying wisdom is validated by what it does. So he's using it in okay. that same kind of vindicated pattern. So um um. This isn't a setup. I, I legitimately don't know. Um, <laughs> sure. When, um, when Jesus talks about um, the uh, tax collector going home justified in uh, Luke 18, sure. um, is he using Dikaio there? Uh, I believe so, yeah. That's actually another okay. passage that I think needs to be grappled with. Um, yeah, yeah he, he's using it there. And, and I don't think we can say universally Jesus and James use it this way and Paul uses it that way. That's why I'm saying we, we have to look at the context of the passage. In that context, it really does seem like in the, the um, tax collector and the Pharisee, um, it really does seem like he's using it in, for lack of a better way to describe it, more of a Pauline sense than the sense I'm talking about. But, but I, I can't see a way to make the, the Matthew 11:19 sense be anything but this vindication pattern. 
Um, so then when I look over at James, that vindication pattern seems to play out in the text in the same way. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't think it's illegitimate. I mean, you know, again, I, I'm not I'm not platonic with my with my view of language. You know, wor- words get their meaning from the context, and, and I think that we can see that that word, as with most terms, can be used in, in multiple ways. And, and that's kind of what I meant by theology by lexicon is that, um, you know, when 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 people are taught to do a word study, you know, by just pulling out every use of a certain word and then looking up the first, you know, definition they see, that that's where I see it as a problem. Um, yeah, and that's not at all what I'm doing. No, and I, and I don't think that's what you're doing. Um, I, what, what, I guess what my and, – and, you know, at best, this is just going to be a, a negative argument. It's not, I don't think it's going to really prove my case or disprove your case with James. But it just – I think you can just see that just maybe existentially, <laughs> it is kind of ironic that the only place where the language of sola fide is used, it's exactly the opposite of what the Protestant would expect. And, it, and, and Luther couldn't figure out how to fix it. It took quite a bit of time to work it out. I'm pretty sure that if that knot hadn't been in there, this would be the primary proof text for sola fide. And if someone tried to get out of it by, you know, claiming that Paul and James are not using it in the same context, even though they use the exact same illustration, um, you know, that you'd probably just be, you know, laughed out of the room. Um, that's not an argument. I, that's just my particular feelings on the matter. But um, sure. I, I do think that, that it's important to go, just to note that that is where the language is found, and James says it, it isn't. You know, and again, I don't think it's a knockdown argument, but you know, we're, we're still talking about Luther a lot, so I'll, I'll stop that. But <laughs> um, yeah, so go sure. ahead. You can we can continue. I think we're yeah, we're and, and, and I would say the, the last thing I'll say is it, it's only the language of justification sola fide if justification is being used in that sentence in the same way that it's being used in the Protestant conception of justification sola fide, um, which I, I just don't think, I don't think that it is. So uh, I, I get the ex- sort of the existential angst. I mean, I, I went through a time when I actually was uh, planning on converting to Catholicism myself. So I've wrestled with all these texts from that kind of perspective. Um, but I just don't think when we really understand the argument that that, that holds weight. Um, I think it's a, a gut reaction um, that doesn't bear out scrutiny under Acts of Jesus. Okay, gentlemen, did you guys want to take a two-minute break? Or we, we did to keep going? Didn't know if you needed a drink or anything? Or I, I think fine. I'm probably fine. I'm, we probably have a lot more to talk about, so we'll use the time, I'm sure. All right. Agreed. Okay, then uh, Doug's second question to you, Tony, is uh, what do you think of the Protestant theologian Alistair McGrath describing sola fide as a genuine uh, theological novium, I think it's, that's what it says, uh, in his yeah. book, uh, let's, I'll let you pronounce that. <laughs> sure, Justitia Dei. Uh, the title of that, for anyone who doesn't speak Latin, so everybody except giant Bible nerds, um, is the book just means <laughs> the justice of God or the, the righteousness of God. Um, so uh, I guess before I answer that question, I just want to make sure I'm clear on kind of where um, the question's coming from. So are, are you asking that question, Doug, because you think uh, that McGrath is kind of a, uh, has, has made a valid argument in the book and that he's kind of got a grip on what's going on in the Reformation. Um, Because I I don't want to accuse you of anything, but I do run into this particular quote on pretty fair occasion uh, where people have just kind of parroted a a soundbite that they found from somewhere else. Um, So if that's the case, if, you know, this is something you've pulled up and you've heard it said before and you haven't looked into it too much, that's fine. Um, Everybody does that on some level. But it changes how I answer the question to kind of know how how you feel about McGrath's argument as a whole. No, that's that's a very fair question. Um, I did read the book a long time ago, and quite honestly, I I couldn't probably, you know, go back through it um, just sitting here right now. that's kind of the famous quote, you know, that like you said, right. it, it sort of pops up all over the place. Um, th- this book, by the way, was uh, McGrath's doctoral dissertation. So right. um, you're not going to find just these sort of offhand um, sound bites that, that can't be backed up. Um, sure. you know, he, he, was, he, he was, you know, writing at, at the, the height of, of scholarly ability at this point and had a lot of peer review. 
He also sure. says things like L- Luther broke with the Western tradition as a whole. He said he introduced a fundamental discontinuity into theological tradition. Um, he said there are no forerunners of the Reformation doctrine of justification. Um, the Reformers departed from Augustine. I mean, it just goes on and on and on in, the, in, this, in this section. So, uh, honestly, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, this isn't a debate. I'm not trying to trap you. I, just, I really would like to know what you think about that. Sure. So um, I, I've heard this before, and on one level, I, I'm going to kind of give the first same preliminary answer I gave with Luther. Um, I have no reason to, um, other than scholarly respect and recognizing that scholars who've studied should be trusted more than people who haven't studied. Um, if Alistair McGrath says something that I disagree with, I'm not bound by any obligation to feel like I have to support it. Um, I like Alistair McGrath. I've used this book particularly uh, extensively in some of my work. Um, But on one level, if he's wrong, he's wrong. Um, I think his assessment may be um, potentially a little short-sighted in some ways, but overall I actually agree with the argument that he's making. Um, And the reason I ask is because you kind of get set on the horn of a dilemma here. because McGrath is speaking about a very specific aspect of Luther's, um, Luther specifically in this case, but the, the Reformation or uh, Reformed Reformation tradition as a whole. And the reason I say you're kind of on the horns of a dilemma is that his assessment is that justification by faith alone as the mode is not new, but justification as a discrete notion apart from sanctification is what is the theological novum. So what he's saying is that um, prior to Luther, um, even if you just go back one scholastic or scholarly generation to Staubitz, um, justification and sanctification were one and the same thing, just like you're describing in the, the Catholic tradition now. So that departure to, to separate them conceptually within uh, the uh, Ordo Salutis or the Order of Salvation, that was what he was saying is the theological novum. Um, I don't have the quote. I do have the quote right now in front of me, but it probably would take too long to find it. Um, But what he basically says is that there's both continuity between Luther's view and discontinuity between with Luther's view and the Catholic view as a whole. And where the continuity comes in is the me or the mode of salvation, the mode of justification, that justification, uh, the mode of it being salvation by faith alone through uh, by grace alone through faith alone. That part is not new. That's the continuity that he identifies. Um, the, the na- what he calls the nature of it, um, which is just this conceptual distinction between justification and sanctification, which any, anyone in the Reformed, particularly the Reformed uh, tradition, but like I said, confessional Lutherans too, will fully acknowledge that the distinction between justification and sanctification is notional. It's just a conceptual heuristic device for us to keep things straight in terms of how certain things happen. Um, Sanctification flows from justification for the reform or for the Protestant Christian. So it's not as though it's a completely separate, discrete thing. Um, So that notional distinction is what Alex McGrath was identifying as, um, as the new thing that uh, Luther was proposing, not the mode or the means of salvation. So he would, he's fully in agreement with uh, the idea that the, instrumental means of salvation being faith alone is not a, not a theological novum. So like I said, you're, you're kind of on the horns of a dilemma. Um, now, as I read certain, um, certain early church fathers, um, obviously Augustine, uh, Fulgentius of Rusby, who was kind of uh, the next uh, big kind of what the Reformed camp would like to kind of claim as a pro-Calvinist, which is historically not a great thing to do, but um, kind of that pr- strong predestination school of thought that that was most famously put forward by Augustine Layden later in his life. Um, as I read them, I don't think that um, justification and sanctification being discrete concepts is entirely new. Um, but I don't have a reason to think that Alistair McGrath's argument is terrible. I haven't read the whole book in its entirety. Um, but yeah, he, he was just saying, yeah, Luther separated justification and sanctification or regeneration in in the original text. Um, He separated those two things conceptually in a way that hadn't happened before. Um, But he also, at the conclusion of that um, section, he basically says that, but it doesn't really matter because the idea that doctrine never changes and that there's not development, um, what he calls the um, both set theory, 
really is kind of a defunct theory, even among Roman Catholic theologians. So the idea that a theological novum would disqualify um, this doctrine really doesn't hold water in the first place, even though it's not fully a, a theological novum. Okay, I pre- appreciate your answer. I I think that my, my interest here is that, to me, the separation um, between justification and sanctification uh, often lies at the very heart of the disagreement. So I, I would say it matters quite a bit. Um, now, th- this is where my lack of familiarity with the, the Reformed is, is going to probably show. <laughs> um, as an evangelical, which is the tradition I kind of grew up in, and more dispensational, um, you know, Dallas Theological Seminary type thing. Sure. Um, the way it was justification and sanctification were explained to me was that justification is a single point where basically someone pa- you know, passes from you know, condemned to on their way to heaven, and that everything from that point forward in that person's earthly life is under the, the title sanctification. But at that point, things start to come into the process of salvation that, that are denied under justification, namely good works, increase of, of grace, increase of faith. Like everything that the person contributes to the process takes place in sanctification. And so if you say, well, are we saved by works? The answer was, well, are you talking about justification or sanctification? You know, can right. you be more or less saved? Depends on which part you're talking about. It, everything, you know, it's kind of like asking a question about Jesus. You know, every question about Jesus is two questions. You know, <laughs> you know, sure. as God or as human. Um, so for me, the 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 the, the, uh, the Catholic view, which is just talking about the process, the whole process under one single term, that is the reason for a lot of the disagreements, because no nobody teaches that we work until God goes, okay, now you're on your way to heaven. Protestants don't teach that. Catholics don't teach that. Um, and, and it seemed to me, at least again as an evangelical, that other than that very you know, timeless, almost eternal point of justification, um, works don't have to be involved there for, for anybody. Um, only if justification is seen as the entire process do things like um, works and righteousness and merit and these sorts of things come in legitimately, and I was left kind of wondering, well, like, what's the big debate then? So I guess my question would be, I mean, if, if, if that is a theological novum and it's just notional, okay, that's fine, but then why is anybody complaining about works being part of our salvation? Sure, and, you not, and I you, think, you know... Yeah, and I can understand why that would be... Um, that's one of the main debates that's happening in uh, the Protestant world. So you do have kind of the more evangelical perspective, which is dominantly uh, the Arminian perspective, which would identify not only in some senses is justification uh, synergistic, but for sure sanctification is synergistic. Um, Justification requires for the Arminian or for the kind of general vanilla evangelical justification requires us to engage our will, right? God sends us this prevenient grace and then we, um, out of the restored ability that we have, we either make a positive or a negative choice to follow or reject Christ. Um, so as a reformed as a reformed Christian out of the Calvinist, specifically the Westminster tradition, um, that whole starting point is off. So even though I would say they're delineating justification and sanctification as separate notional concepts properly, um, they don't have, um, and when I say they, I just mean kind of anybody who's not following the Reformed tradition. So certain parts of Lutheranism, um, uh, people who would consider themselves non-denominational by and large are are falling under this as well. Um, Justification is not synergistic. Sanctification is not synergistic or not not monergistic, just meaning one one actor. Um, But for the Reformed and for Luther um, and the early Lutheran tradition and the confessional Lutheran tradition, um, we are both justified and sanctified entirely by the acts of the spirit. Now, the way that the spirit acts, the means, the instrumental means that uh, is used in those processes differ. For justification, the only ordinary instrumental means of justification is faith. So that's the only uh, the only option that God has revealed that he uses. Um, like I said earlier, God is free to show mercy on whomever he desires, and he's free to do so in whatever way he desires. Um, 
Now, when we get over to sanctification, we would still say that the uh, efficient cause of salvation, of sanctification, is uh, the acts of the Spirit, right? Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that brings us faithfully from justification to sanctification, to glorification, uh, to resurrection. Um, However, the means by which he uses that are different. And that's actually, it's kind of a which comes first, the chicken or the egg kind of situation is, um, realistically, the distinction between the means used in justification and the means used in sanctification is a primary driving force why why the Reformed and why the Lutheran confessional tradition has to maintain that notional separation. Um, because we see justification in the Bible as we read it uh, as being different in terms of the means of, of um, the effective means, sorry, the instrumental means uh, from sanctification, we have to draw that notional distinction. Now, it's not as though the Holy Spirit at some point throws a switch and goes, okay, I've finished with justification, now I have to switch over to sanctification and, and use a different means. It's just that the process of salvation, and we use salvation kind of broadly as the whole process, the process of salvation is by grace through faith for works. But within that process, we can see conceptual delineations that justification is by faith, not works. Sanctification appears to be by faith through works, um, but there's still works that are wrought by the Spirit. So you're right, in, in certain kinds of evangelical circles, um, certain kinds of uh, Arminian circles, especially like an open theist kind of a position where God doesn't quite know what the future is, he can probably predict it pretty well, but doesn't know for sure. Um, those circles, it absolutely is almost to the exclusion of the Holy Spirit in some extreme cases uh, that we are sanctified. We are justified by grace, and then we have to conform ourselves to the image of Christ. Um, where in the, the classic Reformed tradition, really anybody in the, the magisterial branch of the Reformation would say, no, absolutely not. The Spirit is still the one who acts to bring us about in sanctification. You can go through all of the classic Reformed confessions, the Scottish, you know, the Scots Confession, the Belgic Confession, the Westminster, the Heidelberg Catechism, and uniformly um, sanctification comes about by the work of the Spirit in the individual, and the Spirit is instrumentally using our works in some cases to do that. Um, and those may include the means of grace, which would be the sacraments of baptism and the sacraments of communion and the preaching of the word sacramentally as well. Those things are means by which God sanctifies us uh, in addition to our works. So it's it's much more complex than to just say, well, justification is monergistic and sanctification is synergistic. Um, that's not the notional description that Luther especially is making, but the Reformed tradition either. Yeah, I mean, when, when it's described that way, I'm, I almost have difficulty distinguishing what, what the difference in the view is. I mean, if, if salvation begins at a point at which 100% by God's grace, someone uh, exercises faith... And, and hasn't done any what we would call good works, that that you know, sets them on the path, and that from that point forward, uh, God's grace uh, not only um, forgives them, but actually allows them to do works that are, al that are also caused by God um, in, in, a, in a different sort of way, not as a puppet, but um, that you know, the Holy Spirit inside the person, God's life through grace and the, and the sacraments inside the person, um, allows them to do good works, and that that contributes to their growth as a Christian, um, I, I'm not sure how that isn't just the Catholic view. Um, sure. You know, I, well, just, the the distinction is in baptism. So the Catholic view, the instrumental means of justification, or, I mean, the Catholic, but to be honest, like the Catholic view has some of these delineations. You have the distinction between initial justification and ongoing justification, where initial justification would simply be that initial point where justification starts, where Protestants just want to say, well, that's justification, and the ongoing justification is sanctification. So it's not as though that uh, that delineation is completely foreign to the Catholic paradigm, um, but the, the where the description or the discrepancy really comes in is at that initial point of sanctification. Protestants would say initial, sanct or initial justification is by means of faith in Christ alone, where the, the Catholic would say initial justification is by means of the sacrament of baptism as it's officiated by 
um, an ordained priest. Or in you know, in extreme cases, you have other kinds of baptism that can be uh, administered. You know, you find someone dying on the road; it doesn't have to be a priest. But ordinarily, through the regular means of an ordained priest or an ordained bishop. Uh, conveying that sacrament, that's the initial justification. So that's really where the disagreement lies, is whether it's it's justification by faith alone or whether it's justification by baptism and faith alone. Um, so yeah, that, honestly, I mean, I, I can I understand never... why the sanctification part is a different. It's a it's a different paradigm. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, th- this is. Um... Yeah, you know, like I said, I, I don't have a reform background personally, or or even really interactionally. <laughs> um, as as Devin can attest, you can quite easily get all the way through our seminary and learn almost nothing about uh, the reform tradition, sure. um, especially in in these once it gets to these type of matters. Um, I've sure. never heard the sola fide debate um, defined as an issue over baptism ever. Now that might be you know that might be common course in in the reform tradition. Um, but honestly, that that's just not the way I've ever heard it said. Um, it seems like it's always talking about whether or not our works are cooperating with God's grace. Can we even cooperate with God's grace? Doesn't that limit his sovereignty, or doesn't that make man part of his own salvation? And oh, it's semi-Pelagian. And like all of those kind of debates that I usually um, see online, in school, with everybody I've ever talked to, um, baptism has never even come up. Um, and and that, that is probably just an accident of, of my particular history. Um, but uh, Yeah, sure. So, I, so I would, yeah, I mean, I would if, if that's it, and... then really we, we can just, you know, we don't need to talk about anything else, and we can just talk about, you know, what baptism does. <laughs> but sure. that doesn't really well, seem and... to be what started the, the Reformation. It doesn't seem to be Luther's contention. I, sure. I, I just, I mean, I'm not arguing with you that it isn't. I just, I'm kind of taken aback by just like, okay, I, I didn't even know we were going to talk about this. Sure. And, and I'll um, I'll recommend to you and you know to the listener um, are we together by R. C. Sproul. Um, Sproul is kind of the classic reformed uh, you know teacher. He's kind of a popularizing teacher. He's really trying to teach to the average Joe on the street, um, even though he's obviously capable of much things higher. But in his chapter on justification in Are We Together. Um, kind of the source of the book is to go through and look and say, well, do, do Protestants and Catholics really believe the same thing? Are we actually together? In the justification chapter, the main heading is instrumental cause, baptism or faith. And the whole chapter is talking about, you know, whether a person uh, enters justification, initial justification, by means of baptism, uh, which is the sacrament of faith, or by means of, of faith alone. So I, I can understand, you know, why it, it seems um, when you look at some of the stuff that's out there, especially coming out of the more um, Armenian traditions, why this seems to be a totally different debate. Um, but Luther Luther and the Reformed tradition um, really split over um, matters of what is happening in the Eucharist, not matters of how justification works and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to kind of make sure we frame the, the debate properly. Um, you know, I don't. I don't want to necessarily run down a rabbit trail of um, of baptism and you know what it does and how it works because that's that's a whole different night for Devin maybe to have us back another night. Um, there you go. I'm really actually interested in your last your last question. Um, okay. I know that I think mine is up next, but uh, I think you know if, if you want to talk about it, I we lost can. the I lost the order. <laughs> I wasn't sure okay. if you're asking is your question next or is it Doug's question next. Oh, you know what? I think it's your question, question Nick. I think that was the right. That Tony, was the, whatever, whatever, yeah, whatever Tony wants to go to next is fine. Okay, question whatever. three. Oh, I just lost the thing. Okay, and uh, you guys are doing a great job. You're both uh, both representing your views. Uh, very good. Really, really appreciate this discussion. Question three for Doug uh, is: Is Jesus Christ's death on the cross on behalf of sinners? a sufficient condition to bring about the salvation of those who possess faith. If you need me to read it again, I can. Let me know. That's all right. I, I understood it. Okay. Um, Tony, is, is that what you meant? Did you want to move on to my last question from you or my last question for you? I wanted to move on to the last question from you, um, but I, I also okay. want to give you a chance to respond. I don't want to throw the question oh. out without having oh, okay. them a chance well, to Well, I'll respond to really briefly, and then... Um, yeah, you know, we can come back to it later or or whatever, because um, th- this is going to be a pretty short answer. Um, 
going back to the terms again, sorry, you know, again, I'm, I'm not trying to be evasive, but um, this is an extremely loaded question um, that is going to depend a lot on on what a person means by each of these words. Um, you know, su sufficient conditions for for people that don't that don't talk like this, uh, <laughs> non uh, Bible or philosophy nerds. Um, a sufficient condition is something that guarantees its effect. So, in in trying to exegete this question, it seems like you're asking that if there is a person who possesses faith, is Jesus' death on the cross guaranteeing that they will be saved? Is that how you meant it? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and, you know, again, I, I think I would have to go through these terms like, you know, possess faith. What what exactly does that mean? Are we talking about just um, some kind of bare assent without hope, without love, without works? Um, you know, then I, then I would have to say no. Um, but if faith is understood as the kind of faith that saves, well, then it's, you know, that's a, a, different, a different response. Um, as far as the death on the cross, th this, is, this is something that I'm – just biblically, I'm not entirely sure how to answer because Paul says that the gospel by which we are saved includes Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection and, and, and possibly even the, the sightings if you want to include that. Um, so I, I'm not sure that just his death on the cross is the gospel. Um, it, it, it seems like Paul wraps up a lot more into the gospel than just the death part. There's, there's at least three parts to the gospel. Um, if we want to sort of take death on the cross as this is what is paid for, you know, to tell us die, it is finished. Um, you know, we know that he told the thief on the cross that that, that day he would be with him in paradise. Um, tradition says that, that he went to the place of the dead, which is paradise, and, and got the Old Testament saints out, brought him to heaven. Of course, all that happened prior uh, to his resurrection. So if we're talking about salvation as simply, um, you know, guaranteeing that one is on their way to heaven, if death on the cross is sort of wrapping up the entire gospel, then I would say uh, yes, uh, provided that their faith is the kind of faith uh, that saves in, in evangelical language or that it is accompanied by uh, hope and charity um, in the Catholic ling lingo, then I would say yes. Okay. So I, I guess kind of, I mean, I'm sure you can kind of, kind of see where the, where the point would be, or at least the, um, kind of the, the objection I'm trying to get at is it seems to me that um, I, I take your point about the, the burial and resurrection being uh, also rolled in there. So I guess if I were to modify the question a little bit, I would say the, the cross event or the, the whole context, including the burial and resurrection. Um, sure. and Jesus, that's, that's is, Jesus is atoning activity. We can phrase it that okay. way. <laughs> um, whatever that might include, you know, if that incorporates the resurrection or if the resurrection is kind of a sign, that there's different ways to get around that. Um, but it seems to me that on Catholic theology, um, and, and it seems like this is codified in the Council of Trent, is a person who does not supply their own cooperation. Um, supplying their own cooperation is important. I know that grace comes first, but it's still, um, especially in the Middle Ages, there was this idea that you respond to the you respond to that which is within you. There was an idea that the likeness of God was still within you, and you had to act in accordance to that likeness, uh, which was kind of an unaffected part of the fall. That was still the, the natural light within you. Um, it seems to me that that cooperation makes uh, is a is now a necessary condition, which means that the cross the the atonement event can't be a, a sufficient condition on its own. Now that's not yeah, that's, a, that's not a um, that's not a, a critique that I would level against only uh, Roman Catholics. I think that Armenians, uh, even though they're Protestants, still have to struggle with that. Is that cooperation of the will that's been restored by provenient grace now still has to be a necessary condition, meaning that the cross itself is not the only only necessary condition, making it not a sufficient condition. Um, right. So I, I don't and, and I think I, that, I think that you've, Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I, guess, yeah, I think that that's an important distinction for people that aren't used to talking like this uh, need to understand is that is that the difference between a sufficient and a necessary condition. Right. Um, to say that something is a necessary condition uh, means that it is something that, that has to be there but doesn't guarantee it. Sufficient is, is, the, is the opposite. Um, th this, this whole discussion about this question is why I think the, the point versus process uh, 
issue is such a big deal because um you know we we can bring in other distinctions like normative versus non normative and and <clears throat> justification versus sanctification and that that if those distinctions are there it changes the answer to the question um and if they're not there it changes the answer to the question so you know there's a sense in which when you're doing theology you typically speak in normative terms you know normally humans need to eat to live normally they need to breathe to live but that doesn't mean that there aren't certain times um, even even in a normal human's life where no food is present and no air is present, and yet they're still alive. Right. So by sufficient, what I mean is that is it possible for a person to be saved simply because they have faith in the Atonement Act, if we want to call it that? And I say, yeah, I mean, that's sure. But that doesn't mean that, well, then it's just over. Um, in the normal course of life, they are then going to get baptized. They are then going to do good works. They are then going to increase in righteousness. And, and those kinds of things... Um, are part of salvation, but they're only part of salvation in their turn. It's not something that has to be front-loaded in order for them to get um, initially justified in the first place. In fact, Trent is very clear that absolutely nothing prior to justification contributes to it. And that's where I think, again, given the, the distinctions between initial and progressive justification, I, I just don't see that there's that big of a difference between most views. Go ahead. Sure, and, and I, I think, um, and I, I'm trying to choose my language carefully because I don't want you to feel like I'm goading you into inadvertently anathematizing yourself. Um, <laughs> it, sounded it. <laughs> to, it sounded to me like you were saying that it's theologically possible for God to uh, justify someone without cooperation of their will. He can he can justify so it, someone that is is willing but doesn't even necessarily know the gospel. I mean, that's at least possible. Right. So that's the anonymous Christian. But it seems like Trent explicitly anathematized the idea that someone could be justified without cooperation or without uh, contributing cooperation of their will. So it just seems like, um, you know, that's a dogmatic declaration. It's got all of the, all of the formulas from, you know, Pastor Eternus that the Pope is doing it. He's doing it in his office. He's, you know, defining and he's even including anathemas. Um, and binding it on the faithful. So it just seems to me that, to, you know, Rahner's, Rahner's anonymous Christian or Vatican II's anonymous Christian, if you don't want to put it just on Rahner, it seems to me like that's a flat possible contradiction to Trent, is that um, you now have a context where somebody without cooperation, without supply and cooperation of their will, is um, is now justified by God's well, grace you know, so yeah, it just the, the, seems co- to me the like cooperation of the will there would be the fact that they desire God, they desire salvation in some way, even though they don't have the intellectual content to express it correctly as the gospel. Um, sure. So yeah, what what it means is that it's not against their will. God doesn't regenerate a person and then they get faith. Um, so you know, of course, Trent is in the context itself of the Reformation debate. And so it is, it is specifically that that is being anathematized there, that God doesn't save somebody against their will. Their will is in cooperation with his will because of grace. Okay. So it, it, it's the yeah, difference between I, I doing think, something uh, that, is, that is a person's will or against their will. Right. As as I, I, think the, I think the, um, the language that I'm cluing in on is not necessarily so much about doing it against their will. It's that... Trent seems to act as though there's a uh, a necessary um, positive cooperation that anyone who says that justification is by faith alone without the cooperation of the will um, or without supplying charity and hope, both of those, there's two different anathemas and it kind of talks on both of them. Um, it just seems like the anonymous Christian model kind of um, actually even goes a step below that now not only is the cooperation, the positive cooperation of the will necessary, but faith isn't even necessary. Um, it's just a matter of kind of obeying your conscience and, and having a general disposition uh, towards the natural law. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to bog us down anymore because I think your last question is one that I really liked and I think is, is going to be kind of the practical payout of our discussion um, oh, okay. for most of the listeners. So I think that that's kind of where I think we should go now, if that's okay with Devin. Absolutely, yes, sir. We can move right to that question. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Okay. Uh, this is Doug's last question to you, Tony. Uh, 
He says, the official teachings of both Catholics and Protestants is that one cannot work one's way to heaven. Yet one who never acts on one's professed faith is probably not saved. Given this, what practical difference does Sola Fide make? Sure. And, and so I think where this really pays out is it brings from the theological theoretical uh, discussion to a more pa actual pastoral practical application for people. Um, and I think that the main difference is in how each position finds assurance. So uh, I actually uh, think that the second part of the sentence where it says, yet yeah, one who never acts on one's professed faith is probably not saved. I actually think there's a stark disagreement between the Roman Catholic view and the reform view on that. And the reason is because as I understand it, and, and Doug, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that once someone receives the initial justification through baptism, um, that unless they commit a mortal sin, that they will eventually end up in heaven with God. They will eventually receive the beatific vision, whether it be through a process of uh, purgation in purgatory or you know, a, a, a deathbed indulgence or whatever the process may be, as long as they don't commit a mortal sin and don't um, don't thereby kill justifying grace, which is why it's called a mortal sin, um, it seems to me that that person can look back on their baptism and have as close to assurance as a Roman Catholic can have that they will eventually be in heaven. Where on the flip side, the Protestant, uh, particularly the Reformed Protestant, has to look to the present. When I want to know, am I saved, I have to look at my life now. I have to look, am I uh, am I persisting in the faith? Am I persevering in the faith? Um, do I still hold an orthodox confession of faith? Do I still believe that Jesus Christ is the only uh, sufficient sacrifice for sin? Do I still hold that God is a trinity and all of those other um, Nicene Creed kinds of things? In addition to the idea that I need to be seeing the fruit of the Spirit uh, brought forth in my life. So I would actually argue, um, and it would be interesting to see kind of where we go with this, but I would actually argue that the Protestant, particularly the Reformed Protestant position, requires more active works for assurance. Not for salvation, but to bring about assurance in the Christian we have to be continually persisting in the fruit of the Spirit and continually persisting in deeds of charity and in, in goodwill and sitting under the sacramental preaching of the world and participating of the sacraments and all of those things that um, are kind of classically held as um, Roman Catholic distinctives. Whereas the Roman Catholic position creates a, a, an environment where someone can kind of just coast. They could produce zero fruit and it would still, they'd still be able to point to their baptism and say, nope, I received justifying grace, I haven't committed moral sin, therefore justifying grace is still present, which means that I may not go straight to heaven, I may not collect $200 as it were, but I will get there eventually. So I, I think that the, the question is a really good one, um, and, and I, I'm not trying to paint this like the Roman Catholic position um, somehow enables people to be lazy, um, but I think that when I look at some of the Roman Catholics that I uh, I know personally, um, even even kind of high profile converts like Jason Stellman, um, I've been in some some dialogues lately with other people, and he has a, a podcast called Drunk Ex Pastors, and um, this is not trying to be judgmental, but he comes across as someone who absolutely has no regard for holiness in the way that he interacts with people on that, the way he sort of jokes about certain kinds of sin. Um, but it seems like he's able to point back to his baptism and go, well, I haven't done a mortal sin, so I've got that justifying grace. So um, I might have to, you know, go to the priest and do my Hail Marys, but at the end of the day, I'm all set. Um, so I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that, Doug, and kind of where, you know, where that kind of strikes you. I'm sure that it's not a, not something you'll agree with, um, but I hope it'll be a good kind of discussion point. No, I think you nailed it. Um, <laughs> Don't, don't ever nice. cut that off and then make a little, uh, you know, uh, meme out of it or something. Um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree that, that that is the way it can seem. Um, you know, it's funny listening to you talk again. I, I you know, um, I don't know. I know Devin is kind of more of a recently reformed guy. Um, again, coming from an evangelical background, I was, I was just laughing to myself, thinking, "Oh my gosh, this guy's such a legalist." You know, um, <laughs> you know. You're, you're, you're looking at what you do, and are you producing fruit, and are you going to church and the sacraments? I mean, my gosh, you know, why don't you just go worship a statue? You know, you might as well just get it over with and become Catholic. Um, 
what I what I noticed in my transition from um, evangelicalism over to Catholicism um, was that it was interesting to me that depending on who you're talking to, the Catholic Church gets equally uh, denigrated for either A, being too legalistic, or B, being licentious. <laughs> you sure. know, so on the one hand, you have people saying, oh, the church is so legalistic, there's all these things you've got to do to be saved. And then on the other hand, you have people saying, oh, you can do whatever you want, and you can just go you know, to confession and, and you're still saved. And I think that there's, that there's a sense in which that is kind of um, indicative of the fact that the Catholic Church really is holding a balance between two extremes. And, and I think that for me, that was a big part of, the, of my attraction um, to Catholicism. It wasn't the, the, the reason for my conversion. But the fact that the more I looked into it, it seemed like, gosh, it seems like they can really um, hold hands with both sides and without falling on, on, on one extreme or the other with a lot of things, um, doctrinally, morally, they just they they very often seem to have, have struck the right balance between something that that is admittedly in tension, and I and I think that every Christian has these tensions. You know, it's so obvious that salvation is by faith, and yet it's so obvious that we have to have works. What do you do? You know, there's got to be some some mediating position, and et cetera. So all that to say that first of all, I'll just say this: it was far easier for me being an evangelical than it is being a Catholic as far as my day-to-day -day activities go. Um, as an evangelical, I was, I was taught that my justification was a one-time event that I could look back to and I could never lose. And so there was a sense in which all the sermons that I ever heard telling me, well, you have to go out and not sin and be good and do all these other sort of things – I was never really sure where, what exactly to do with those because on the one hand, I'm being told that nothing I do matters to my salvation, and yet every sermon I heard after the gospel presentation was all the things I had to do. And so, you know, with the Catholic faith, they draw a line and they say, look, there are certain things that if you, if you do them in full knowledge that it is, that it is mortal, mortally sinful – um, and you do it willfully, there's, there's actually a bit of a, of a recipe for a mortal sin. There's no such thing as a thing that is a mortal sin. Uh, mortal right. sin is committed uh, under, and, and I'm not saying you were wrong, but this, this is a, a, a popular notion that's, that's false. Um, you know, basically, to commit a mortal sin, you, you, you kind of have to be given the finger to God. You, you, it's not just something you fall into. It's not something that, oh, oops, I accidentally did X. Now I'm going to hell until I get over to my confessional. Um, it is a very willful, hateful act. And so the Catholic is not spending their time really, really terribly concerned about suddenly falling into hell. And yet at the same time, there are very clear lines between what is going to cause you serious trouble and, and what is not. And so th that's on the, more of the negative side. On the positive side, I mean, Catholic spirituality is, is extremely positive. Um, the, the church just offers a wealth of things um, for the Christian to explore and, and to do um, in their relationship with God. And there's a sense in which, look, if someone doesn't participate in those things, then they don't participate. Um, but it doesn't necessarily change their salvific status uh, any more than it does for a Protestant. It's, it's almost like, you know, what, what do I have to do to be married to my wife? Well, on the one hand, I can just look back and say, well, we got married, so um, no matter what, we're married. But no one who appreciates their marriage would just let it go at that. You know, you're not, I'm not just going to not commit adultery, and I'm not just going to not murder my wife. Okay, that, that's not enough for a marriage. <laughs> that's going to be a dead marriage in a sense. Um, and so, yeah, I am going to do the things that contribute to the good of, of my marriage. Um, that doesn't mean that if I don't do them, I'm not married anymore, but it does mean that there are certain things that, that I need to do to have a living, true marriage. And there are also things I can do that, that would destroy the life of our marriage. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily end it legally. But I, I think when, when we look at our relationship with God more under those terms than sort of the legal courtroom terms that, that are often preferred um, by Protestants, it makes a lot more sense out of the Catholic view, at least, that there's a ton of stuff that I want to do to be right with God, and there's a lot more stuff I'm afraid of doing uh, that will ruin my relationship with God. And all of that makes for a very vibrant faith. 
but yeah, there's tons of people that just don't care, and, and that's the way it goes. And it's the same thing with evangelicals. It's the same thing with with a lot of people that they don't avail themselves of the graces that God offers. Um, sure, and I, other, I guess you know, I guess ahead. my um, my question though, and kind of where I'm drawing this line, is from my understanding of the Catholic model though. Um, those people will still eventually have the beatific vision. The people who are baptized, let's just take kind of your classic, quote, cradle Catholic. They're baptized as an infant. Um, they you know, are probably in the church until they're in their teens, and then either their parents stop making them go or they graduate from school, they go off and do their thing, um, especially those people who are not properly catechized because one of the components of a mortal sin is with full knowledge that it's a grave sin and full uh, engagement of your will. So if you're not properly catechized, it's almost impossible for you to commit a mortal sin. Um, Especially those people that just kind of go on their life, they still will eventually have the beatific vision, right? Meaning that they'll eventually make their way. They'll eventually be purged in purgatory through whatever process that is. And I know that, that's kind of an open question as to how purgatory actually works. But whatever the process is, they will eventually reach the beatific vision. Yeah, I mean, if, if they don't deny the faith and they don't, um, you know, thereby commit mortal sins, then yes, they they, they eventually will attain the beatific vision. Okay. I mean, they may so, have to suffer so, horribly for thousands of years, sure. <laughs> you know, for what well, they did. There's, there's obviously the discussion that's going on now about whether time is even appropriate concept for well, yeah, purgation. I'm, I'm, but, I'm, I, mean, um, I mean that qualitatively, not quantitatively. Right. So there. But the, the difference is that um, as a Reformed Christian and as a, um, you know, if you're a, a confessional Lutheran, and, and I'm, not, I'm not meaning to, I, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm slamming my uh, Arminian brothers, but in a sense, this is exactly what the Reformed world and the confessional Lutheran world points at evangelicalism and at the Arminian world and goes, this is why this is a faulty uh, theology is because it does lead to, frankly, to an understanding of Christianity that you walked away from. I would walk away from that too. Um, I almost did walk away from it. That the same kinds of questions and the same kinds of struggles was was what caused me to start to question it. Um, but in Reformed Protestantism, that person who gets baptized as a baby based on the faith of their parents and then walks away and doesn't ever uh, produce fruit there's no assurance for that person. That initial baptism is not assurance for them. Um, even someone who has made a profession of faith at some point, if there's not an ongoing profession of faith, an ongoing growth in righteousness, an ongoing um, development of the fruit of the spirits that I am committing daily to those things, um, then there's no guarantee. However, on the flip side, for those who do persevere, for those who endure, as Peter says in, in 2 Peter first ten, he encouraged them to make their election sure. Those are the ones that have assurance. Um, so to me, that just seems like a, a fundamentally flawed issue in Roman Catholicism is that you have this whole class of people that, frankly, um, people who are really serious about their faith in Roman Catholicism, in my experience, seem to be the exception. Um, I live in New England. There's a lot of Roman Catholicism that's kind of around and the vast majority of them, it's just kind of a, just kind of a part of their, their life. They don't really, you know, they have to go to Mass because not going to Mass when you can avoid it is a mortal sin. But other than that, um, they, you know, it's just not a thing. Um, it seems to me that that really can foster a kind of complacency that a robust understanding of kind of the final cause of justification being that we're saved for good works can really avoid so I just think pastorally it's really important for, you know, whether it's Protestants like me to kind of speak out and say, no, justification is a one-time event, but you don't know if you're justified unless sanctification follows, because sanctification always follows justification. Um, or whether it's a Catholic saying, you know what, um, you're just not getting what Christ has promised you if you're not persisting in charity and hope and love. Um I think that's really important for people to emphasize as they speak to people because it's just something that's really missing in the Christian life, I think. Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of it is just it, there, there are different perspectives because I could characterize the Reformed faith as, as being, okay, well, one of two things is going to happen. E- either someone believes in justification, sola fide, and perseverance – 
and they know that they had faith at one point, and so now they're just not worried about it anymore. Um, so that is not necessarily a, a real good, um, you know, motivation to do good. Now, I don't think that that actually happens. I think it's pro- it should be at least more like what you're describing. Um, but just theologically, it's easy for me to go, yeah, that, that kind of seems like that could happen. Um, oh, it absolutely or, happens. Or you it don't really have assurance much. because you don't, you know, you, you know, you've got this sola fide, that's great, but you don't know if it happened to you or not. Um, I, I'm sure you would agree that, that doing works is not a sufficient condition for justification. So the fact that right now you're doing some good works, I don't know how that really gives you any more assurance other than, well, it just kind of really seems like it right now. Um, and then if you're doing works motivated by the fact that you're just afraid that you're not really justified, maybe now you become legalistic. So um, I, I'm, I'm just saying that given given certain theologies, it's it's easy to say, well, it seems like this or that would happen. Yeah, there have been a lot of Catholics that just rely on their baptism and going to Mass, and that's it. But again, the, the Catholic view is that justification happens by faith with love and hope. Someone that loves God is not going to just you know, walk around being an idiot all day. So I, I would say, no, you don't really have any more assurance that you haven't lost your justification after baptism. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you should be confident in that. Um, you know, with, with 1 point whatever 7 billion Catholics, I mean, there are a lot that take advantage of that. <laughs> um, okay. Just like there are a lot of evangelicals that take advantage of, of, of their teaching on justification. But that's not what the church actually teaches people to do. And that, that's really all I can say is that that's, that is not the actual life of the Catholic Church when it's being taught correctly. Oh, okay, let me, let me break in here because we've got about four minutes to go. Tony, take two minutes, wrap us up, then Doug, take two minutes, and uh, conclude your thoughts. Sure. Um, I, I First, I just want to say thank you again, Devin, and thank you, Doug. Uh, this has been an absolute blast, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Um, as far as kind of wrapping up the, the discussion, I think what we've seen tonight is that um, although in some areas there does seem to be some overlap and some shared perspectives, on who God is and what he expects from us. Um, I think there's still a very clear divide between Roman Catholics and Protestants on how specifically, uh, whether it's justification in the kind of Protestant paradigm or initial justification in the Roman Catholic paradigm, um, how specifically that comes to be, with Protestants um, classically affirming that it's by the instrumental means of faith alone and with Catholics uh, saying it's by the instrumental means ordinarily of baptism faith and good works. Um, so I, I think that the, the line is still very clear and the Reformation continues. Um, there's a lot of forces who want to kind of say, no, the Reformation's over. And I just don't think that we can say that. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of Roman Catholics who trust Jesus for salvation and, and that's what we say they need to do. Um, so I don't want to pronounce judgment on Roman Catholics, but I do think that the position uh, that the church, the Roman Catholic Church holds is is not... Um, accurate according to what the scriptures teach. Okay, I, I'd All also right. like Thanks, to, to thank Devin uh, for having me on, and Tony, it's, it's been a real pleasure um, talking to you, and I'm not just saying that. Um, I, I'd love to continue this on air or off, um, just because you're a, you're a smart guy, and um, it's, it's just been really nice uh, talking to you. Um, I guess what I, what I would finish with is, is that um, having been a, a very staunch evangelical for, for a number of years, um, one of the biggest surprises for me as I started to discern the Catholic Church was how little of evangelicalism I really felt like I had to give up. In the sense that the more I understood about the Catholic faith, the more I realized, ah, these intuitions that I had here and there that I could never quite work out, um, they all seem to really flower and, and, and bloom in the Catholic dogma. And this is why I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the show, that sola fide was really not a huge issue for me. Um, because, not, not because it isn't an important issue, but because as an evangelical, as the Protestant, I was exposed to so many different versions of what sola fide could mean. I mean, there's, I think I counted four multi-view books put out by um, Protestant publishers uh, discussing what does justification mean, what does faith mean, and what do works mean. There's two different books on what sanctification means. I mean, there's there's a dozen published <laughs> people arguing over this. And what I discovered was that when I looked at what Rome actually teaches, it seemed like 
the best of each of the Protestant views was being brought out and put together in a way that, that no single Protestant had ever done it. And so I, I would just encourage people to read up, especially on the catechism, what the, what the church actually teaches, and not just something that it said 500 years ago in a different context. Um, it's important to see the way the church understands uh, justification uh, dogmatically today, and I think you might be surprised at what you find. All right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, thanks both of you guys. You know, you guys have really modeled uh, how we can have these discussions, and they, they don't have to be uh, nasty and angry. They can be civil. They can be intelligent. And, uh, Doug, really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, you know, love you to death. You're uh, a good friend, and uh, appreciate you coming into the lambs den here. <laughs> So to speak. Hey, you, you and, two uh, separated, brethren. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate it. Next week, folks, uh, we're going to continue the debate. We're going to have uh, Brandon Vaught from Strange Notions and our good friend Mike Willenborg. We're going to do another two-hour debate on Sola Scriptura. So thanks for joining us. Tony, thank you. Doug, thank you. And uh, the, down, the uh, podcast will be available right away, so feel free to... Uh, download the podcast and uh, share it and get the word out. And uh, thanks, everybody. God bless. God bless, Kevin. God bless.